Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ron Bayer. I'm the um, acting head of the School of Economics. Um, welcome to our 2013 edition of the Joseph Fisher Lecture. And it's actually really great to see so many of you um, having shown up on a Friday night where there's so many other things one could do. Um, in a few moments, um, Paul Dulwig will introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Paul is the university's vice president of service and resources. So Paul is responsible, among other things, for finances, for um, human resources, property, and so on. There are two reasons why I think it's a good idea to have Paul introducing our speaker tonight. First of all, he's one of our own. Paul um, holds a master's and also an honors degree from our school. And so he exemplifies our claim that actually we are, um, we are preparing our graduates um, for jobs in leadership roles. The second reason is that it well, has also to do with Paul's um, job in the university, and it has, um, or that's paraphrased the Dean of Law, um, John Williams, he recently said, um, Paul once a year rocks up in his um, sedan at 10 Paltner Street, where our faculty is, and opens his coffers and asks for money. So I thought, let's get him and let him work for his money. <laughs> so Paul, would you please introduce our speaker tonight? Well, thank you very much, Ralph. Um, I have never been introduced in that way before, so that's, that's a first for this evening. But also, I've never had the honour of uh, introducing the uh, Joseph Fisher Lecture, and I'm very pleased to do that as a graduate of, uh, of this fine uh, economic school. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people in the language of the Ghana people, uh, Ghana Mina, Ghana Yorta, Nutsu <laughs> Tampindi, uh, which means we acknowledge the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains um, and particularly the land on which the university's four campuses are, are built. Uh, the Joseph Fisher Lecture, as many of you will know, has been, um, been uh, presented since 1904 for the University's School of uh, Economics and uh, was set up by uh, a very uh, generous endowment of £1,000 from Joseph Fisher, a prominent Adelaide businessman, 110 years ago. So this is the 110th anniversary of that, uh, of that contribution. Um, it also included the medal for the top accounting student each year. We're very happy uh, this evening to uh, welcome uh, Elizabeth Russell and uh, Tom Fisher. And Elizabeth is a, a, a great, great, great something. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure how many greats there are there, but um, uh, from the Fisher family, so welcome, welcome this evening. Uh, I had a look at the, uh, the previous uh, lecture presenters for this uh, uh, distinguished um, lecture series, and really the, uh, it's, a, it's a who's who of, um, of economics, both from Australia and, and internationally, and uh, certainly this evening we have another very fine speaker. Um, and I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Francois Bourguignon uh, from the World Bank, uh, Chief Economist and uh, former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist from the World Bank um, and Director and Founder of the Paris School of Economics. Um, uh, with the, the topic tonight is the globalisation of inequality and I'm very keen to hear it as I'm sure you are. So welcome and uh, thank you for coming, Professor. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, this introduction. It's a pleasure and a great honor uh, to be here today, to have been invited to give this uh, Joseph uh, lecture for uh, 2013. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, the follower of so many uh, very prestigious uh, lecturers in uh, uh, the same uh, circumstance and uh, also to uh, be given, uh, giving a lecture uh, named after uh, a real benefactor to uh, this uh, university. Uh, I think that uh, uh, throughout the world, and maybe uh, in countries like Australia, certainly a country like uh, France, we have uh, very much uh, to learn uh, from uh, the uh, uh, relationship between business 
people and the university. And it is really nice to see in that case that uh, such a contribution done uh, more than a century ago is uh, still alive and uh, still uh, producing uh, uh, very uh, important and very uh, interesting uh, um, events. I hope that uh, the event today will be as interesting as the ones that uh, you probably already have heard in the previous years. What I will be uh, <coughs> talking about today is the globalization of inequality. And I would like to start by <coughs> Uh, explaining why uh, this title. Uh, this title. Very often when I'm uh, telling people that I'm uh, interested by the globalization of inequality, they immediately translate, oh, you're interested in globalization and inequality. The off here is really quite important. What I want to mean with this uh, title is really two things. On the one hand, I would like to insist on the fact that inequality is becoming a global issue. And uh, I have been uh, working in uh, uh, the World Bank. Uh, I have been involved, and uh, several people uh, in uh, this room have been involved in uh, this kind of uh, global uh, 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 organizations. This may be the bank, this may be the United Nations, this may be uh, some regional uh, development bank. And uh, what we can see when we operate in uh, those uh, uh, circles is that uh, there is more and more concern by the uh, global community, by the international community, about what is going on in the whole world, and in particular, uh, about differences between the poorest people in the world and uh, the rest of uh, uh, the humankind. And uh, the goal of uh, trying to put together, trying to make closer in terms of uh, purchasing power, people at the bottom and people at the middle and people at the top is something extremely uh, important. And uh, I will show in just a moment that indeed we are making progress, but there's still a lot of progress to be done. The other meaning that we can give to globalization of inequality is completely different. It is the fact that the increase in inequality is becoming global in the sense that many countries are uh, uh, being uh, uh, the uh, pla places where inequality is growing very fast. And what I will show uh, in just a moment that indeed when you look at OECD countries, there is a majority of countries where over the last 20, 25 years, inequality has increased enormously. And uh, this may be a concern. This may be a concern because uh, it is possible that if too much inequality uh, uh, if inequality increases too much, this may become a threat towards the globalization of uh, uh, the uh, economy and the gains that we can obtain from globalization. So these are the two aspects, the uh, inequality becoming a global issue and what can be done about it, and on the other hand, inequality increasing in many countries in the world. To uh, illustrate those two aspects, let me give you two uh, uh, quotes. The first quote is uh, from uh, Raymond Aron, who was uh, uh, a political philosopher. Uh, he was uh, initially a friend of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, and then later on uh, in his life, he became a strong opponent to uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. And uh, uh, in a book which was written in uh, the early 60s, which was called The Dawn of uh, Global History, he wrote the following, in a human society in the process of unification, inequality between nations acquires the same meaning as inequality among classes in the past. Standards of living differ today between continents or between countries more than they ever did. At the same time, the perception of inequality increases, whereas resignation to poverty and to destiny is disappearing. Now, this is an illustration of looking at inequality in the first sense. It is inequality becoming a global issue. The second quote, which is also from somebody called Aaron, with a slightly different spelling, uh, Henry Aaron, who was an economist working in the Brookings Institution, and uh, who has produced uh, uh, several important uh, work, one day said the following, uh, studying inequality, income inequality is like watching grass grow. 
In other words, uh, what do you do, all you people who are interested in income distribution and this kind of, fee of issue? Nothing is going on there, so why not to switch to some more important issue? Well, uh, uh, if Henry Aaron were uh, still alive, then he would uh, see that uh, suddenly uh, inequality is uh, growing very fast, or in other words, maybe uh, grass is growing much faster today. Uh, maybe this is a consequence of climate change, uh, but uh, basically it is uh, uh, the recognition that income inequality per se is uh, something important and the big increase that we are observing today is the reason why we want to uh, uh, focus on it. The facts and the questions that we'll be looking at in this presentation are the following. In terms of facts, I want to emphasize uh, a very interesting evolution that uh, we are going through, which is a kind of uh, opposite, uh, two opposite phenomena. On the one hand, I will show that what we observe today is that after two centuries of increase, the global inequality uh, over the last 20 years, 25 years, is decreasing. And this is an historical event. This is a true reversal in, the, uh, 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 in history. And the second phenomenon, which goes exactly in the opposite direction, say that, uh, and again it is an historical reversal, after decades of stability in many countries, inequality started to increase, started increasing uh, since uh, the mid-80s, depending on the country, early 80s, mid-80s, uh, 90s, depending on the country. So we have these two opposite phenomena, which uh, could, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, upset each other, but uh, we will see why uh, they are, for the moment, uh, not upsetting each other, and they are, for the moment, parallel. The question that uh, we may ask, uh, based on uh, these uh, two facts, is what is behind that? If inequality is increasing in many countries at the same time, it is likely that there is a common cause to that increase. And that common cause, the most obvious culprit we can think of, is really what has been changing our societies very, very much over the last uh, uh, decades, which has been the globalization process, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, in a new uh, accelerating wave uh, since probably the uh, uh, early 90s and probably since the early uh, 80s. So the question is, is it the case that those two reversals that uh, I am uh, emphasizing, uh, are they due to globalization? And uh, what is exactly the causal relationship between those two phenomena and uh, the way in which global globalization is proceeding? And then the third question is, uh, if this is the case, uh, if globalization is producing uh, that result, if at the same time globalization is responsible for this progress, which is less global inequality, and if globalization at the same time is responsible for more inequality within country, isn't there a risk that because there will be too much inequality within countries, there will be social tensions, the economies, the societies will not function well, and at some stage there will be some kind of opposition coming or arising within uh, nations against the globalization process, and therefore uh, putting at risk the global gain that we can observe today in the global economy. Now, if this is the case, then what can we do in order to uh, uh, mitigate, in order to uh, make sure that uh, such uh, evolution will not take place and that it will be possible to continue uh, accumulating gains on this uh, globalization drive. Let me move to the first point, facts. The first fact is this reversal in the evolution of global inequality. What you have in this picture is the following. First, it is a description of the evolution of global inequality in the most general sense. By global inequality in those pictures, <coughs> what I mean is the following. I'm looking at all citizens in the world, 
and I'm looking at the inequality among them. This means that if I want to focus on the top 10%, the top 20% richest people in the world, in those 20% of people, I will find Australians, certainly. I will find many Americans. I will find many Europeans. But I will also find some Chinese. I will also find probably a uh, uh, right, uh, 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 reasonable number of Brazilians and probably a reasonable number of South African, simply because they are rich people, of course, in those countries. And when I'm looking at the bottom of the uh, distribution, I will certainly find many people living in Sub-Saharan Africa, but I will still feel, find some Chinese, I will find some Indians, and this is the way in which global inequality is defined here. It is uh, if tomorrow uh, we were to consider the global community as a, a true community, this would be the degree of inequality that we would be observing. In this picture, you see two series. On the left-hand side, and starting in the early uh, 20th century, you have a, what I call an historical series, which is based on work that I have done with a colleague of mine who is an economic historian, where we try together to figure out what had been the evolution of global inequality as I just defined it since not the beginning of the 20th century, but the beginning of the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. And then what we found is that without any doubt, without any uh, possibility of being wrong, that this degree of global inequality had increased uh, regularly, constantly, since the beginning of the 19th century. And what you find here is uh, the end of this process. You have uh, those uh, dotted lines, which correspond to uh, the 20th century. And you see that they are both upward slooping. The red line corresponds to a an indicator of uh, inequality called the Gini coefficient, uh, which is a summary measure which takes into account all the, all the parts of the income distribution. The blue curve at the bottom is uh, the ratio of uh, the top 10%, the mean income of the top 10% uh, richest people in the world over the uh, mean income of the bottom 10%, uh, 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 the first people in, in the world. And the, on the right hand side, you have the evolution of the recent period. And there is a discontinuity basically because, of course, uh, the kind of data that you can use uh, on the historical period are not the same kind of data that you can use today. Today, we can rely on very good data in terms of uh, uh, household uh, sample surveys. Uh, we have that more or less in all countries in the world, or at least uh, covering uh, 90 or 95 percent of the world population. Uh, we didn't have this kind of data in the early 20th century. And uh, in the historical period, uh, the countries were not the same. Uh, many countries didn't exist in uh, the early 20th century. Remember the independence process uh, uh, back in the, in, in, in the 60s, where many countries uh, appeared and were still countries appearing uh, uh, today. So because of that, uh, there is a discontinuity. And you see that uh, in 1989 or 1990, uh, when we move from one curve to another, that there, there is a jump. As a matter of fact, the jump is due to the change in the number of countries. The change is also due to the fact that the historical period is based on data coming from uh, a well-known economic historian uh, named uh, Angus Madison, who spent uh, a part of his life uh, putting together historical data on GDP per capita. And uh, he was using to compare the purchasing power across countries. He was uh, using a, 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 a purchasing power uh, index, which, uh, was, which had been put together for the year 1990. Uh, and uh, lately, uh, a new purchasing power parity uh, index has been released based on much better data of price comparison across many countries. This was done in 2005. And then we discovered that uh, we tended to underestimate the level of uh, purchasing power or the, level, the standard of living of uh, people in some countries. And uh, because of that, uh, suddenly there was more inequality uh, in the world. But it is simply an issue of 
uh, uh, definition, what matters is the time change. And what you observe on that figure is the fact that the curve uh, on the right hand side are downward sloping. And the drop in inequality that is taking place, that has taken place over the last 20 years, uh, from 1989, the last point is 2010, this change, this uh, drop, is really very important. So inequality is falling in the world, and it is falling big time. And uh, if you compare the uh, increase in the historical series over almost a century with the decrease which took place over the last 20 years, uh, they are more or less equal in absolute value. In other words, in 20 years, the global economy has been able to erase a century of increase in inequality. So this is definitely an historical event. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, uh, in 50 years, maybe a century from now, when historians will be looking at that time, that period of uh, our era, they will insist on this very fact. This is what is going on at the global level. What does happen at the national level? Here we have a different type of chart. This is the Gini coefficient, this inequality index, for most OECD countries. Uh, I took out of those OECD countries the uh, recent uh, the newcomers in the group, which are the countries coming, uh, which were the Eastern European countries, because those countries, in terms of inequality, have gone through a very particular uh, 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 event which has been the uh, the switch the tra the, tra the uh, uh, modification of the economic system and the fact that uh, they went from a socialist economy to a market economy which initially increased very much inequality so it is difficult to uh, uh, consider that what has been going on in those countries is something which is uh, 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 completely uh, uh, standard <coughs> what we observe here is that uh, the uh, change in the Gini coefficient, you have uh, countries uh, where the, the bar is on the right hand side are countries where inequality is increasing to so see that two thirds, more than two thirds of those OECD countries have seen their inequality increasing between the mid 80s and the mid 2000, 20 years. If we were to update those data, and the uh, data for 2008 for OECD countries have been released uh, a few months ago, and I didn't have time to update this uh, chart. If we were to, you, to look at 2010 or 20, uh, uh, 2008, which is the last uh, uh, data set, we would find that more countries have seen inequality increasing. Here you can see, if you look for Australia, Australia is the uh, first country at the bottom with a negative change, a slightly negative change in the Gini coefficient. Very slightly because it is less than one percentage point. So uh, it is not even sure that it is something really which is statistically significant. But if instead of looking at mid 80s to the mid 2000, we were to look to the mid 80s to the end of the 2000, we would find that inequality has increased in Australia. You have also the case of France. France is also a country which is on the bottom part with a negative change in inequality. If we were to look at the most recent data, in that case, the inequality in France has definitely increased. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, fact is uh, something which is very general. Developed countries, in general, have gone through uh, a period of uh, increase in inequality and big time. And what is also important is when you look at if you were able, and don't think that you are able to read the name of the countries, but uh, the top country is Finland. A little below that, you have Sweden. Now, those countries are countries which are known to be strongly egalitarian. Uh, not countries which are known to be strongly social, democrat, uh, uh, social democratic countries. And despite that, inequality has increased in those countries. So this means that there is something very strong which is uh, uh, taking place in all those countries at the same time. If we want to have a more historical view at that evolution, we could look at this uh, chart, which is 
uh, another indicator of inequality which has been put together by uh, colleagues of mine, uh, Tony Atkinson on the one hand and uh, Thomas Piketty on the other who is uh, also at the Paris School of Economics, looking at uh, tax returns for several countries uh, since, again, the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century. And what you observe on this uh, chart, and this uh, uh, inequality indicator here, is a share of the top 5% uh, of the population of, the, of income in uh, the total income of uh, uh, households in the respective uh, countries. And I should add that this is the share of market income that is before taxes and transfers. The situation would be not so pronounced, I mean, the changes would be not so pronounced with taxes and transfers, but yet the, the shape would be exactly the same. And what you have, you have a U-shape. If you look at the top curve, which is the blue curve, the uh, US, uh, you see that the US had a huge level of inequality in the 1920s. Then you had a drop in inequality, in partly, partly due to the crisis and the fact that uh, many uh, very wealthy people lost their fortune during the crisis. Also the war and the increase in uh, 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 and the, the uh, change in the way in which the econo economy functioned during the war. Then you have a period during that which the inequality is very stable from the early 50s until the uh, beginning of the 80s, so uh, 30 years of stability, and then starting in early 80s, an increase which is very strong. Today, the inequality measured by that measure, by that index, in the US is at the same level as it was uh, exactly one century ago. And you have something similar in the UK, uh, Japan is there, so you see that it is also a phenomenon that we observe in Japan. Uh, France, in this uh, picture, uh, the increase is much more uh, moderate, but yet there is an increase. And uh, if we were to look at the most recent data, we would see that uh, the slope of that curve is increasing. And at the bottom, you have Sweden, where again you see that the top <coughs> Uh, income in Sweden have been gaining quite a lot. And the last piece of uh, uh, data that I want to emphasize on developing on developed countries is another aspect of the distribution, which is the macro distribution between the two uh, main factors of production, uh, labor on the one hand and the other factors, let's say uh, property and uh, of course uh, mostly uh, capital there. Uh, the reason why it is important to take that into account is with that we know that uh, the capital incomes are very often underreported and uh, very often they are underreported because uh, the uh, capital gains, for example, are not necessarily realized by the owners, uh, by the shareholders, in which case the uh, capital gain is an additional income which, is, which does not appear in any statistics. So it is important to look at this kind of information because this is telling us uh, something about the causes for more inequality and at the same time uh, it is uh, showing that there is more uh, uh, happening than what we can see in more micro uh, data. And what you observe here is that for basically the G7 countries, all of them have uh, a secular uh, decline since uh, 1985 uh, of the labor share in uh, GDP. If I had put Australia here, we would have exactly the same phenomenon in Australia. In uh, over that period, the uh, share of labor in GDP has lost more than five percentage point in uh, Australia. So it is something very similar to the curve that that we have here. So. Definitely, there is this big increase taking place in majority of great majority of, can, of developed countries. What has happened in developing countries? This is the same chart as before: change in GDP coefficient. Uh, bars, which are on the right hand side, correspond to countries where inequality is increasing between the mid 80s and the mid 2000. At the bottom, we have countries where inequality is decreasing. 
This time we cannot say that two thirds or a great majority of developing countries see an increase in inequality, but we see that a fair number of them have seen an increase in inequality, and some of them a big increase. At the very top, you have China, uh, or more exactly, the urban sector in China, and uh, <coughs> the uh, increase in Gini coefficient has been more than eight percentage points, which is something truly uh, uh, enormous. But if uh, you were able to read uh, the uh, names of those countries, you would find that most of East Asia is there. You'd have Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam. In all those countries, we have an increase in inequality. India is also a country where there's been big increase in inequality. So uh, the emerging world certainly is a world where inequality has increased. Uh, Latin American countries are not in that picture, the reason being the following. Uh, Latin America had an evolution of inequality which is very specific. Inequality increased enormously between the 80s and uh, the end of the 90s. And since the beginning of the 2000s, inequality is decreasing. So you have a kind of inverted U for Latin America. And overall, when you look at the early 80s and you compare to the situation today, uh, there has been a small increase in inequality, but certainly no decrease in inequality, knowing that Latin America is a continent where inequality is the highest. So the conclusion of all this is this double evolution, change, drop in global inequality, increase in national inequalities. This is possible, why? Uh, because when we look at global inequality, there are two forces. One is what is the change in inequality within countries? And another force is what is the change in inequality between countries? And what we, the reason why global inequality is going down these days is simply because the inequality between countries has been going down. So what we observe today is a drop in inequality between countries, but an increase in inequality within countries. But the second force for the moment is not strong enough to offset the overall change in global inequality. Let's move now to the causes for that evolution and whether uh, we can consider that uh, definitely globalization is responsible for that and uh, uh, therefore that uh, there is uh, something which is uh, uh, which can be, which is under understandable uh, in the evolution that I just uh, described. Let's start with the evolution of the inequality between countries. Is globalization responsible for what we observe? And the answer to that question is partly yes. What we observe, what is behind the drop in inequality between countries, it is a catching up of, uh, by, of, of developed countries by emerging countries. Uh, this big acceleration of growth in uh, China, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, India, and lately Africa, Latin America, this is producing a reduction in the distance in terms of income between rich countries in the world and middle-income countries and pro-income countries. The dynamism, the action is more on the emerging side, that is Asia in particular, but, uh, uh, and this is the following point, there has been spillovers of that very fast growth to Latin America and to Africa in particular because this fast growth has uh, uh, produced an increase or more demand for basic commodities uh, like oil, like uh, mining products, and from that point of view, Australia is also uh, benefiting from this very fast uh, growth of emerging countries, and also uh, more demand for uh, some agricultural uh, uh, commodities. Now, is globalization what is behind this catching up? We cannot say completely uh, that it is the only force. Uh, when uh, China woke up, uh, in uh, the uh, end of the 70s, early 80s, uh, China didn't open up immediately. The first uh, uh, moment or the first acceleration of growth in China is essentially a domestic reform, which is the 
so-called uh, Household Responsibility Act when the uh, freedom was given to farmers to produce not only what the planning commission was asking them to produce, but to produce more if they wanted to, and to be able and being able to sell this additional, this extra production on the market. So suddenly, the uh, incentives for producing more were released, and immediately we could see this increase, uh, this acceleration of growth. So this means that uh, China started to grow simply because they decided to reform the system. In the same way, India started to grow faster in uh, the early 90s, basically because they started reforming their uh, economies. Now, it happened that a little later in China, more quickly in the case of India, they also decided to open up because uh, uh, relying only on the rural sector was not enough. It was important to uh, industrialize, and uh, China decided to industrialize relying on foreign direct investment and relying on manufacturing exports toward uh, the rest of the world and relying on the competitive advantage of China, which was a very abundant uh, 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 population of uh, unskilled labor. So. From that point of view, we can say that globalization has played a role, definitely yes, but uh, not the only role. And if tomorrow the globalization process slows down, maybe because developed countries will not be able to recover the rate of growth that they had before the crisis, we may guess or we may expect that in China, in India, in other countries, growth will continue because growth will rely either on the domestic market or on south-south uh, trade, which has developed enormously over the uh, recent past. So uh, globalization is there, and it is a very good thing. But uh, what is also a very good thing, and what is also there, is the dynamism of the uh, developing world, which is uh, something new in the global economy. When we look at what has been going on within countries, then we have many explanations. And probably the most popular one is to say, no wonder that there is more inequality in developed countries. Look at the competition between developed countries and those emerging countries which started to export and to produce manufactured goods uh, and to invade the world with their manufactured goods. Basically, this was a relocalization, relocation of important activities uh, intensive in unskilled labor from developed countries to developing countries. So the demand for unskilled labor went down, and therefore their income, their earnings went down. And this is the reason why inequality has increased. This story is partly true. And it is likely that in some countries, probably the US, probably the UK, a lesser extent uh, continental Europe, uh, this phenomenon uh, took place back in the 80s. But at a later stage, uh, the process had to come to an end. All those in industries which were employing uh, uh, unskilled labor uh, and uh, uh, which were uh, goods which could be exchanged with the rest of the world, all those sectors have simply disappeared from developed countries. They all went to uh, emerging countries. So today, uh, unskilled uh, workers in developed countries are not anymore working in sectors which are competing with emerging countries. They are working in services in a sector which are, to some extent, not exposed to uh, the competition. But other workers are exposed to competition. And who are they? In particular, those workers who are in activities, in tasks, which are being offshored to the rest of the world. We know that call centers, uh, we know that accounting services, back uh, office uh, activity in uh, banks, in insurance companies, more and more are being concentrated in uh, uh, emerging countries. And it is very easy to exchange information through the modern technology. And uh, because of that, uh, one uh, uh, part of the labor force in developed countries, which is at a reasonably high, uh, level of skill, is being 
uh, uh, competed uh, out by uh, people with the same kind of skill in emerging countries. So the competition between uh, 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 developed countries and uh, emerging countries has been moving up one uh, 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 level, if you want, in terms of skill. If this is the case, and there are uh, evidence of this uh, evolution of the labor market in developed countries, then we may understand why people who are, as a matter of fact, gaining in the globalization process in developed countries are people who are at the top in terms of skill. Not only those people at top in terms of skill, but also the uh, owners of uh, capital and the managers of uh, multinational companies and by contagion uh, of the managers. Why? Simply because the globalization process is, before all, a reallocation by several companies of their activity throughout the world. If those companies do that, it is not because uh, uh, suddenly uh, the CEO uh, finds it uh, quite attractive to go around the world and to visit uh, exotic countries. If they do that, it's simply because it is more uh, uh, effective in terms of cost to do so and profits are going up. So it is only natural to find, as we have seen before, that the share of capital in the uh, total income of those countries is going up simply because the whole process of globalization is done uh, by or obeying a profit objective. So now we are putting the picture together. We see that high skills are the only one who are not so much exposed to foreign competition. Capital owners, executives, managers are gaining in the process, and this explains why the top 5% and people who are just below the top 5% are those who are gaining in the process of globalization and those who are gaining and who are creating this increase in inequality. Now, there are other factors. And uh, in the economic literature for a while, and this was uh, true in the 90s, there was this big debate especially in the US, uh, about the reason why it was observed that uh, the bottom of the distribution was losing. Uh, some people saying this is a competition of uh, uh, Asian countries, and this is a relocation of part of the activity uh, uh, intensive in unskilled labor toward uh, Asia. And others were saying, no, no, this is not due to that. This is simply because technical progress is strongly biased toward skilled labor, toward machines, and unskilled labor are simply not demanded anymore because the technical progress is uh, uh, making a saving, uh, uh, is uh, uh, demanding much less of uh, uh, those people. So there is certainly something of this type, uh, but uh, we have to realize that technical progress is not something which uh, comes uh, suddenly from heaven. Uh, it is not something which is completely exogenous. We have people, uh, we have agents who decide about doing more or less technical progress, who are deciding about what is the kind of technical change, the kind of innovation that should take place and that should increase the profit of uh, the uh, companies. And from that point of view, we can say that globalization may have played a role in the sense that one consequence of globalization has been the increased competition among all uh, firms, all producers in the world, and the response of firms to more competition is to become more competitive, and to become more competitive you try to innovate uh, more than it was the case before. So it is not clear that we can say that uh, technical progress is something completely independent from globalization. I personally believe that there is a link between them. How much uh, is uh, probably something which would have to be determined, but uh, uh, globalization is behind uh, part of the technical progress. All that I've said in this slide concern really developed countries. What does happen in developing countries? Shouldn't we find in developing countries exactly the opposite of the argument I had for developed countries? If uh, uh, workers, unskilled workers, 
uh, are losing in developed countries because they lose their job uh, than the unskilled workers in uh, developing countries should be gaining because they have more jobs. And this is true. This is definitely what happens. We can see in uh, China, we can see in Indonesia, in uh, all those countries which are growing very fast, and uh, partly because of uh, 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 exporting uh, labor-intensive manufactured goods, that more and more people have moved from the countryside with a very low level of earnings to the urban side where earnings are higher. But the point is also the fact that uh, the earnings of people in the cities has increased, but it turns out that it has increased less than the profit in those companies which were uh, expanding and which were responsible for this uh, uh, incredible uh, growth or incredible expansion of uh, trade in those countries. If you look at the ratio of, I mean, the share of labor in the uh, total uh, income, total value added of uh, companies in uh, China, in India, uh, you'll find exactly the same evolution that the one have shown for uh, developed countries, for the GDP of developing of developed countries. We find that the share of labor is going down. And uh, today, one of the uh, options that uh, the Chinese leadership is considering in order to uh, push uh, growth and in order possibly to have growth more uh, inward oriented is precisely to try to push the increase in uh, wages considering that uh, wages are lagging behind productivity. Productivity has grown uh, faster than the wages and as a consequence profits have increased. So it is not, there is no symmetry there. Uh, it is possible for inequality to increase in both sides, but you can see that inequality in developing, <laughs> developing countries, there are uh, a negative aspect, which is probably the fact that richer people are getting richer because uh, the uh, profits are increasing, but there is also a positive side, which is the fact that very poor people in the country part uh, are moving toward better jobs, and this is what is behind the fact that uh, 500 million uh, Chinese uh, went uh, out of poverty in 20 years. This is something which is essentially uh, good, but uh, this is not necessarily in contradiction with increasing inequality, as we have seen before. Uh, China is a country where inequality has increased. Now, is it the only story? Globalization has also uh, other impact. Uh, there are other equalizing factors which are quite important and which may also be linked indirectly or directly to globalization. One is the fact that the uh, enhanced competition in the world linked to globalization is responsible for a big movement of deregulation which took place in many countries. And of course, in the country where regulation was the most important, which were the developed countries. The financial sector is probably the sector where most of the deregulation has taken place. And we know that the, de the deregulation has created situations uh, where uh, 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 we have uh, basically uh, policymakers by deregulating have uh, created rents for some uh, uh, players in the financial sector. Uh, and we have seen that uh, the recent crisis was partly due to the uh, position, dominant position by several banks uh, which are considered as too big to fail uh, in order to, uh, if you are in such a situation, it is obvious that you have a rent and uh, because if uh, uh, we people want to take the rent away from you, your threat on the whole economy is enormous. So the development of the financial sector, the globalization of the financial sector certainly plays a huge role in uh, explaining the increase in inequality. When you have traders in uh, big banks, when you have uh, uh, executives in big banks making a lot of money, then the chief financial officer in a big company cannot make less money than somebody in a bank. Because uh, if uh, he wants to go to work in a bank, or if she wants to go to work in a bank, it can, it, he or she can do it immediately. But if the CFO in a company is paid at a very high rate, the CEO cannot be paid at a lower rate. 
and is the CEO is paid at a higher rate, then the deputy CEOs are paid at a higher rate. So you have a huge contagion taking place uh, through this uh, uh, process, and uh, uh, this is an hypothesis. I'm not sure that uh, it would be satisfied, but one might very well think that the driving force toward this huge explosion of very top earnings has something to do with the uh, uh, deregulation of the financial sector. Deregulation of the labor market. In many countries, the argument has been we need to be more competitive, there, is, there are too much regulation in the labor market, let's deregulate, and because of that, we will be able to maybe pay our workers a little less, to be able to uh, fire or hire them more uh, easily, and through that we'll be more competitive. But we know that, again, this must necessarily have had a, an impact on inequality. Another factor which is extremely important is the change in the tax system. In most developed countries, what we observe over the last 20 years, 25 years, a bit more than that, I mean, the big, uh, uh, reform, the first big tax reform uh, is in the US in 1986, so it is not yet 30 years. There has been this big drop in the progressivity of the tax system. Uh, to give you an example, in uh, the UK, in the early 80s, the uh, top marginal tax rate was 83%. It is today 40%. And we have had this kind of uh, a fall in the top tax rates, which is more or less in all countries. Even in a country like Sweden, when Sweden went through the crisis in the early 90s of the banking sector, then they decided to adjust their economy, and part of the adjustment was a drop in the progressivity of the system. And again, the argument may be competition, uh, globalization. If we are taxing our CEOs, our entrepreneurs at a too high a level, then those people will not have the incentive to compete with the rest of the world. So competition uh, due to respond to the challenges of globalization requires less uh, progressivity and in some cases uh, requires uh, trying to reduce the size of uh, the welfare state. So again, I'm not saying that Globalization is the only culprit. I'm simply saying that globalization has played a role in this evolution. What can we do? And uh, I will try to go quickly on uh, this because this is my, 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 my I think I'm uh, almost at, uh, at the end of my time. Uh, what are the policies that we can try to, uh, to implement? The first thing that I want to repeat the basic point, which is we want to keep the process of global equalizing in the sense that this is uh, in terms of social justice, in terms of geopolitical equilibrium, it is important for this process to take place. Uh, and what we want to do, we want to avoid the increase in national inequalities to threaten that process by making the developed countries more and more inefficient, by increasing social tensions within countries where inequality is increasing, and at the end of the day to push people toward uh, in opposition to in, in an opposition uh, against the process of globalization and what is responsible for the uh, uh, equalizing of the global distribution. This is what we're trying to do. So we can act at two levels. At one level, we can try to make sure that the process of global equalization will continue. And from that point of view, I don't think that there is a lot of doubt on the fact that the catching up by emerging countries on developed countries will continue. I already made a better point on this, and I will not come back on that. But I think that there is a concern about the fate of poor countries. Today, most of them are surfing on high commodity prices. Now, what may happen is that commodity prices may not, may not uh, keep increasing systematically over time. Let's hope that they will stay at the high level that they have reached today. 
Now, if prices are not going up, then there is a, a growth engine in poor countries that will have uh, disappeared. And we are in countries, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, where there is a very, very strong pressure of demographic growth. Uh, in the next 40 years, the population of Sub-Saharan Africa will double. There will be one billion more African people in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in the next 40 years. What will we do with those people? What kind of job will these people have? How will we, uh, if uh, the only kind of uh, income is uh, mostly coming first from exporting commodities, how will it be possible to share that income in a much larger number of, uh, 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 among a much larger uh, population? And from that point of view, the challenge of uh, making sure that the poor countries will not lag behind, uh, that has been the challenge of the last 30 years, this challenge is still present today, and we have to make sure that we have uh, international policies, that the international community is ready to continue along the line of the Millennium Development Goals uh, to make sure that uh, poor countries not only are not lagging behind, but poor countries progressively will be uh, joining, will be getting closer to emerging countries. And there are different uh, uh, part of the agenda, I don't have time and I will not detail that. What can we do at, within country? Within countries we have to accept the fact that the forces towards more globalization and therefore the forces toward more inequality within countries are unlikely to disappear in developed countries. The competition between the north and the south will continue, maybe the competition will be enhanced now that the uh, competition is moving toward new sectors. Uh, maybe the competition will be enhanced by the fact that there are difficulties uh, in uh, developed countries to keep growing at a fast pace when uh, there is not the difficulties in emerging countries. So we must be prepared to, 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 to that. Now, given that, what can be done? Many people, and this is a big risk, would be to say, Let's stop globalization. Let's go back to protectionist uh, policies and let's protect ourselves for further deterioration of uh, the situation. And uh, uh, is this uh, a solution? Uh, of course, this solution is extremely dangerous because this would be stopping the global growth and all the gains, all the benefits for the global community coming from the globalization. But on the other hand, we know and there have been studies of this type that it is not a convincing uh, solution to reduce inequality. Why? Simply because maybe protectionism will help workers at some level of skill who will not be competing anymore with people on the uh, other side of the world. But at the same time, protectionism will hurt the consumers because they will have to pay a price of goods which will be higher. Now, it turns out that many of the consumers are also workers. So on the one hand, they will be gaining maybe because there will be less competition in the rest of the world, but on the other hand, they will be losing because they will be paying their goods at a higher price. When you look at the balance, the impact is really not uh, clear, and it is definitely not uh, uh, granted that even to fight inequality, protectionism be, could be a, a solution. One possibility, and certainly something which has to be considered, is to reverse the process of globalization, of deregulation in the sectors where we know that deregulation has produced inefficient situations. And the financial sector is an obvious example. We just have gone through a huge crisis where we could see that uh, the deregulation of the financial sector was uh, responsible for that crisis re-regulating again, we would at the same time uh, make the global economy and the national economies more efficient, and at the same time would contribute to reducing inequality in those uh, economies for the reasons that uh, we have seen before. And we could say probably the same thing about labor. I'm not saying that we need to uh, regulate 
uh, labor at a, in an extreme way, uh, uh, controlling all the uh, salaries and uh, controlling uh, uh, hiring and firing by uh, companies, but uh, certainly uh, making sure that uh, there is a fair bargaining process between employers and employees, uh, making sure that uh, the least productive workers uh, are not discriminated against, making sure that there is no discrimination on the labor market between gender or in some countries uh, at the, uh, between uh, ethnic groups. All these are measures which go in the direction of improving the efficiency of the economy and reducing uh, uh, inequality. And this is something which must be done. In developing countries, the process uh, by which uh, inequality has been increasing uh, in uh, those countries that I described a little earlier, uh, wages not growing as fast as productivity in many of those countries, at some stage, this process should uh, uh, invert itself. Why? Simply because uh, the day there will be much less people willing to go to work willing to migrate from the countryside to the cities to work in the factories, that day wages will start increasing much, much faster. When you go to China these days and you talk to the uh, manager, to the entrepreneurs, they are telling you that uh, they have reached the point where there is scarcity of labor. So it's very surprising to see that you have scarcity of labor when you still have 400 million people living on the countryside. But the kind of labor they are referring to is a labor which has been uh, uh, overemployed to some extent, which are young people, and I would almost say young women, uh, moving from the countryside to go to work in all those factories producing goods uh, which, are, uh, which are exported. So uh, this point may come, but also, it may uh, not be the case. It may be the case that further expansion of uh, those economies will take place without very much demand on more employment, in which case uh, uh, there will not be this uh, uh, drop in uh, inequality uh, taking place in the future, which means that also in those countries uh, fighting inequality uh, is something important and finding the instrument to do it is important. Let me finish with the fact that in all the countries there are also redistribution policies that should be uh, uh, taken uh, into account. Now, I've said part of the increase in inequality is due to the uh, fall in the progressivity of uh, uh, the tax systems. Now, we might say, OK, let's go back. I mean, when the uh, marginal tax rate for uh, top incomes was uh, 60% uh, in the US, in uh, Europe, uh, the economies were not uh, working so badly. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were growing rather fast. So why not, why shouldn't we go back uh, uh, to, those, uh, to those days? Uh, and there is, of course, a, a very uh, uh, high desire by some governments to, to go in that direction. But the problem, and again, this is an issue of globalization, is that we are facing contagion. We are facing mobility of people across countries. Uh, you know probably that I'm coming from a country where uh, the government has just decided that the marginal, the top marginal tax rate for uh, incomes above 1 million euros should be 75%. And we have seen that uh, some people and uh, some famous people have decided to go to live in uh, some other countries and to uh, uh, leave the country with their wealth uh, when it is a, a well-known movie actor, maybe it is not that important. When this is a big entrepreneur uh, or a small uh, entrepreneurs, this is much more of a problem. So because of that, it is probable that without some kind of coordination, it will be possible to go in that direction. Now, is really coordination impossible? I'm not completely convinced. I'm, I must say that I'm struck by what we observe today with this big fight against tax havens, which started with very uh, aggressive policy by the US, which is now followed by many European countries, uh, if this process succeeds, this is a sign that some coordination is possible. So I don't think that we simply have to eliminate the possibility on, by saying that uh, there is a risk toward the bottom because of uh, that kind of a competition. 
in developing countries, if inequality is not going down because uh, growth is, is, is keeping very fast and uh, uh, is still producing a lot of uh, uh, employment, then again, redistribution is possible in those countries. And what we have to say is that today the redistribution through the tax system in those countries is very limited. And what is surprising is that it is limited at the time where the capacity for states to monitor individual income is increasing. Who is not using a credit card? Who is not using a bank account? Uh, when you look at the middle class or the uh, upper middle class and uh, the top uh, class. All those people are using financial uh, means of uh, this type and this is easily uh, monitored by the tax authority. So moving in that direction should be much easier today than it was the case 20 years ago, 30 years ago in uh, Latin American countries. And in some countries, this is something which is starting, uh, but probably uh, in a, in a, not in an uh, enough uh, uh, aggressive way. And a very good example of the kind of redistribution that can take place in developing countries is this uh, emphasis or this uh, uh, multiplication of uh, the so-called cash transfer programs uh, in many countries, in Latin America first, but now also in uh, uh, many countries in Asia, by which uh, governments are simply redistributing cash to uh, low-income people. 20 years ago, this, is, this was impossible. Uh, not a long time ago, I went to Namibia, uh, and I saw something uh, uh, really quite interesting, which is the fact that uh, they have a minimum pension given to people who are not getting any official pension uh, from uh, the social security system. So if you are uh, above 60 for a woman, above 65 for a man, you are entitled to a minimum pension. Everybody has a, a card, a credit card, a smart card, and uh, every month uh, there is a truck which goes to the village. On the truck you have an ATM machine, and people went uh, climb on the truck they uh, put their finger, because uh, uh, fingerprints are being recorded, they put the card and they get the money. Uh, this is, and, and of course, if they want to do it a second time, then the machine will tell them, no, no, that's it. You already got uh, your, uh, your pension. Suddenly, this kind of redistribution becomes possible. This is possible at the bottom. It should be possible at the top. And from that point of view, we could not uh, consider that uh, increasing inequality these days in developing countries is a, uh, uh, something which uh, we cannot remedy. And final point, in most countries, developing countries, developed countries, uh, we can still do a lot against inequality, even though this is not directly linked to globalization or uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon, simply by equalizing opportunities. Uh, Human capital uh, policies are important, of course, in developing countries, but even in developed countries. Uh, in my country, in France, uh, you know that there is this uh, PISA uh, 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 test, which is organized by the OECD, where in all developed countries and some developing countries, they are uh, taking a, a, a test on 15-year uh, 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 school uh, students. And uh, you look at the uh, distribution of the result. In France, the mean is more or less at the middle of uh, the international ranking. Uh, not too good, not too bad. But what is quite incredible is the fact that the variance of the test of the scores in France is absolutely enormous. The reason why we are at the mean is simply because we have a top group, uh, uh, top elite, and at the same time we have a group of people who are doing extremely badly. And we know exactly what it is. We know that on the one hand we have the elite, the intellectual elite of the country, and on the other hand we have the suburbs, we have the second and third generation migrants, uh, which definitely are discriminated against. So here we have very clearly gains that can be obtained that will lead to more efficiency in the economy and that will lead to less inequality uh, uh, and less perception of inequality.
And then the other possibilities. I'm not sure that I should mention the taxing bequest, mm -hmm. since I learned that uh, the reason why Joseph Fisher uh, decided to make a donation to this uh, uh, university was partly not to give the same amount of money to the state. So uh, as a tax, as a bequest, as a tax on bequest. So maybe I will, uh, I will not, I will jump on the, on this, but. Yet, this is something that uh, has uh, to be considered and which is equalizing, again, uh, opportunities. So, I'll conclude on this, the summarizing the main point. Globalization is a positive sum game with potentially adverse distribution effect at the national level. Growing national inequalities may have a huge economic cost at both the national and the global level. They are a threat on the whole uh, improvement in the global community and because of that there must be control, there must be contained and there is no reason to be passive. Uh, we can try to correct all the market failures uh, through right, efficient, effective regulation which will enhance efficiency and at the same time will promote more equality uh, and uh, we also know that more uh, more equal distribution of opportunities is efficiency enhancing. And let me finish only by a very good example. This is, uh, this is uh, what uh, personally is making me very optimistic. This is the evolution of inequality in Brazil. This is a Gini coefficient in Brazil. You see that for the, we have uh, uh, observations since 1975. You see that during 25 years, inequality in Brazil was at a very, very high level. It was one of the most inegalitarian country in the world. And the big peak you have uh, there is due to the hyperinflation crisis in Brazil where poor people are very badly protected against hyperinflation. Now what we observe over the last 12, uh, last 12 years is uh, an incredible fall in inequality. Now, I'm not saying that Brazil is becoming a very egalitarian country. It is still very inegalitarian. But what is quite uh, uh, unexpected to some extent is this big drop that took place over the last uh, 12 years. If uh, 20 years ago you had asked Brazilians and uh, experts on the Brazil in the world, do you think that uh, the Gini coefficient in Brazil one day might be uh, below uh, 0.55? People would have said, no way. Uh, this country is in that uh, kind of inequality trap and they will not be able to get out of it. What is behind that? Many things. What is behind that? You have a uh, uh, conditional cash transfer program which is very effective. You have education, which has made a lot of progress. You have faster growth, which generated employment and therefore more employment in uh, 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 small, in uh, poor families. You have demography, the uh, uh, drop in fertility uh, in low-income families, which means that in those families, income today has to be shared by a smaller number of people. All this is behind that drop in inequality. So this means that action is possible. Uh, it is possible to reduce inequality. There is no uh, curse uh, behind that. There is no fate behind an increase in inequality. And it is on this optimistic note that I want to conclude. And thank you very much for your attention.